Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of the third meeting of the committee to review the long term operations of the Central Valley Project and Safe Water Project, sponsored by the US Bureau of Reclamation. We acknowledge that Northern California exists on the occupied territory of over 100 tribes. This land has been stewarded by indigenous people since time immemorial. We acknowledge the critical importance of the land and water to the indigenous peoples of California today, and that the existence of tribal communities and preservation of traditional indigenous ways of life depend on the landscape and environment. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Goodwin. I have the honor of chairing this committee and this this morning, we're delighted to be hearing from some of the tribal interests uh, related to water and the management of water in California. Uh, we'll be hearing first of all from uh, Chief Sisk and then hearing from the your tribe. I'd just like to ask if there are any other tribal interests in the audience that would like to make remarks. So, Seeing none, we'll be hearing those presentations. We'll take the presentations one at a time with the opportunity for the committee to ask questions of the speaker after that. And then we'll be concluding the open session of the meeting today with the opportunity for any public comment, uh, particularly those who have signed up yesterday um, and uh, you had to leave before the meeting concluded. As I mentioned, our first speaker is Chief Colleen Sis, uh, a well-renowned teacher mentor. She's a spiritual leader and tribal chief of the Winnema Winter Tribe. The tribe practice culture and ceremonies in their territory along the Cloud River watershed. Chief Sis assumed leadership in 2000. And beyond her immediate tribal responsibilities, She's a leading advocate for salmon recovery in California, the Human Right to Water Initiative, and the protection of indigenous sacred sites. She is also an internationally renowned speaker on human rights and unrepresented indigenous peoples around the world, which she works for the United Nations. She was also the recipient of the United Nations 2015 Wisdom Treasure Award. So Chief Sis, we'd be honored to have you here today. No, turn over the podium to you. Okay. I want to pray over this water for us to hear things and know things. This is the Macleod River water. And since we're talking about the cold water of California, let's really be specific about it because that we all know, right? Scientists all know that, right? That's common knowledge, is it? That Big Springs puts out probably the most cold water of any river in California. That's where the winter run belonged. That's where the winter run came from. In our traditions, um, we believe that 
the creator had all these spirit beings inside of Mount Shasta. And, and he came back and he said that he, he had created this place outside and that we were to pick who we would be, the physical beings, take physical form and go take care of that place. So er everything went out the doorway of the spring and became something named the bats, the eagles, the, the flowers. All of the things came out and named themselves, except for one small spirit being who was still walking around that sacred fire inside of Puyo Puyo, Mount Chester. And inside they kept thinking, well, what should I be? What should I be? I'm going to be something big and great and wonderful. And then they would say, oh, I'm going to be a bear. And it's like, oh no, they already chose all the bears. And so finally, this little spirit being uh, chose to be human and ran out the door. And as soon as that happened, uh, the creator looked down and thought, boy, that was going to need a lot of help. So we're going to call back the fire spirit and the mountain spirit and the water spirit because they're going to need a lot of help. They're going to need a lot of direction, a lot of uh, information that they have no idea about. And so as he was explaining to these beings how they were going to help this human, uh, the salmon spirit heard them talking because he had just gone out before. So he comes back and says, well, I'm going to give the gift of voice to the human so they can communicate and they can make things better, do things a good way. They'll talk about it. And so since that time, the Winnemum people have been in, indebted to salmon. And the history of salmon reflects what our history is. When the salmon lost their homes on the McLeod River, so did the Winnemum Wintu people lose our homes. When the <laughs> winter run salmon and all the salmon started depleting in numbers, so did the Winnemum Wintu people. And so we have a great deal at stake here. And um, we were told a long time ago when Livingston Stone came and started doing things with our fish at the hatchery, the medicine people got together and the doctors got together and they did a, a ceremony for our salmon. And those salmon were sent through the ice waterfall. And we were told there they will wait. And for all of these years, I really didn't know what they meant, just that the story was there. The story told us what happened and that there were salmon waiting. So when the Bureau of Reclamation uh, pushing the Shasta Dam raise again, we did a war dance on the Shasta Dam. 2004. We had to get stringent um, permission to do that. The Bureau of Reclamation didn't want us to bring our weapons to the war dance. And so then one of our uh, warriors said, well, can we bring our rifles and guns then? Because NRA says we can, but we can't bring our bows and arrows and spears. And so they kind of settled down and let us bring the, <laughs> the bows and arrows and spears. Then they said, you can't have uh, a fire out there burning for four days, but you could have one in a barbecue pit. I said, no, these fires are related to the sacred way of being and this land and, and what we're doing. And so we went out and we put tobacco down where we're going to put that fire. And Slowly they agreed. Then they said, you can't dance out there all day and all night. You can't be out there. You have to, you can arrive at six in the morning and you have to leave by nine in the evening. And we said, oh no, we can't leave our sacred fire. Uh, it has to be tended. It has to be taken care of. It has to have prayers all night long. And, and we're the people who do that. And so finally, um, we got a permit to the Winnemum Wintu tribe to do a war dance on the Shasta Dam in full. So we stayed there for four days, burning the fire for four days and dancing and singing and praying um, for the river. And that war dance took place. But because of that war dance, we were, we were told on the mountain that uh, we needed to tell the world what was happening here. 
And uh, that war dance was a part of that prayer that came down from the mountain. And as we did that war dance, um, they said, well, you need to tell the world what's going on here. And it's like, how do we do that? You know, we're a tribe of 126 fluctuating members. And most of our people didn't go to school. And most of the schools we've kind of dropped out of because of the situations of the schools here in the North State. We, my generation was the first even allowed to go to these schools. My mom and my dad both went to boarding school, but they went late as teenagers because they were on the river. But when the Shasta Dam came in, they sent all the young people to the boarding school, including our mom and dad. And all my uncles and aunties and everybody went to boarding school. But after that, the public school allowed us into the public schools. But they didn't really make it uh, a successful pathway. And so there were huge numbers of dropouts in the, in the public schools, as well as uh, our boarding school people, you know, left boarding school as soon as they could to enlist in the service. So they went and fought for this country during the time that uh, our land was being flooded by the Great Dam, the Empire of California. I, I know you guys went and saw the Shasta Dam, right? And you did you see their movie? No? Oh, you guys should have seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need to go back and watch the movie. Anyway, I saw it years ago, and it's uh, all about this miraculous, humongous, earthen, I mean, not earthen, but a concrete dam that, uh, you know, saved, saved the Cal California and saved the nation. And hundreds of millions of dollars are, uh, are made because of that dam. The transporting of water, the exporting to the oasis in Southern California, um, all kinds of things happened because they built that dam. But they also had Livingston Stone, who was the expert at the time on salmon, saying that he could produce as many salmon in hatcheries as they do in the wild. So don't worry about putting a fish package around that dam or any dam in California. And so all of the scientists at the time agreed, I guess, that that was the case. And so they didn't put a fish passage. Didn't even think about it. Well, I guess they did think about it because there was a still water uh, passage that was um, built and actually they uh, found that the salmon would swim up the redwood planks and get to their destination. But at the time it was like something like $130,000 or something to build it. And it was not much too much money for the salmon. And so they didn't. So now here we are today, <laughs> um, talking about this. What do we do about these dams? What do we do about getting the salmon? Because in my mind, um, you know, I come from this storyline that says whatever happens to the salmon happens to us. And so if the salmon don't have good water to swim in and they die out, then that's a signal that we will too. And the salmon are the gauges of water in the ocean as well as in the high mountain rivers, streams. And so it's one of our um, only gauges like that. And so what does it mean if, if this room of scientists, if you lose the salmon, how does that affect your life? You find another job, right? You, you study something else. But for us, it's devastating. It was already devastating having the salmon blocked from coming to the McLeod River. Now we're on these projects trying to bring back, one, the New Zealand salmon, because the war dance reached out into 87 other countries to say what was happening here. And New Zealand was one of those countries. And New Zealand sent us an email saying, do you want your salmon back? Because we have them. And so then we went and we we danced in New Zealand for those salmon. 
And that was a prayer in itself because, you know, we're not a tribe that has uh, vacation money at sorts to go traveling the world. And in fact, most of our tribal members had not flown anywhere. And so getting them on an airplane to go to New Zealand was another task. And it, we had a very short amount of time because we didn't know they were in New Zealand. And we didn't know when they run in New Zealand. And we didn't know that there was even two islands in New Zealand. And the only thing that I knew was from my UN connections that I had talked to the uh, New Zealand uh, rapporteurs and uh, uh, the representatives for human rights. And so I called them and I asked them to help us. And they did, they got us in contact with the Naitahu people in the South Island. And we were able to make that journey and dance for those salmon and establish this uh, very concrete relationship of family between the Winnemum and the Naitahu people. And since that time, that has not, that has not broken. They have come here, we've set up meetings with the BOR, uh, we've set up meetings with California Fish and Get Wildlife and, um, and NOAA. And in fact, um, Brian Elrock was in NOAA at the time. He and another guy came to uh, up to Mount Shasta to our ceremony that we brought John Wilkie from New Zealand to talk to about bringing back the salmon. So <laughs> that was way back in 2009 or 10. And we were knocking on the doors of NOAA and Fish and Game and whoever we could uh, think of that might, might care about these things. But in, in a, instead of, um, we found dead ends, dead ends. Uh, we did get VOR to pay for a DNA because scientists wanted to know whether those fish were actually from California that lived in New Zealand, or were they from the McLeod River? Well, sad part about it is there are no more fish in the McLeod River to compare them to. So the, the most we could do is establish that they are from California. And we did a DNA test for two years uh, to try and establish that. At that time, you know, the biop said winter run, so we're trying to find winter run in New Zealand because nobody really knows what runs they are. Um, so that th that testing had happened back then, but now we're here today, still trying to get the eggs from New Zealand because we believe they are the oldest DNA mountain climbers that we could get back into the McLeod River to do the job that they should be doing. And they want to do that job. But now we have a problem with pathogens. And I haven't heard anything about pathogens in this. Maybe this is the wrong committee to talk about um, what's in the cold water, because I believe if we have cold water and that we have a healthy environment, we don't have pathogens. We have pathogens when it when it water warms up and the situations change that are not supposed to be that way. So um, we could have did some pathogen testing when we were doing the DNA testing. That would have been marvelous, right? But nobody suggested, oh yeah, and we're gonna have to have pathogen tests. No one said that until we got into this with the winter run. And the only reason we're into the winter run uh, is because our target is bringing back the New Zealand fish, salmon, and to build a volitional passage. Those are our two um, main components of why we're in a uh, MOU and MOA or whatever it is with uh, fish and game and, I mean, fish and wildlife and NOAA is because of that. But their whole push is, of course, the winter run um, 
issues that are happening because of the drought and because uh, they might go extinct uh, if nothing is done. And so while we understand that, our purpose in bringing the New Zealand salmon back is because they are wild. They're still wild in New Zealand. And that's what we're targeting, a wild fish, not a hatchery fish. And we had believed that, you know, the hatchery fish are pretty much responsible for all those pathogens that are a problem with our river systems now. And we didn't want them on the McLeod because it has been isolated from those pathogens. And it, it has been that way since the salmon left. So if the salmon come back, then it will, um, it will adjust to the salmon that are in there. And if it's a, a cold environment, it is an environment that is healthy, these fish will adapt and thrive just like they were always there. A lot of people think, well, how are they gonna adapt? Well, nobody thought about that when they sent them, now did they? <laughs> they just sent them in these rail cars in buckets or cans, shipped them to New Zealand. Who in their right mind would think that would happen? <laughs> and now it's like, oh, can we fly them back? Is it gonna be too late? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what happened, you know, it's like caution has arisen in the science committee or commissions that were that risk taking has become almost too late. The studies that want to be done, they're going to be gone. Our concern is, is that um, sea level rise, climate change is also affecting New Zealand. And the salmon runs in New Zealand, while they're still healthy, they are not in population. They have been reduced almost in half because of sea level rise. And so now we're at this race to get eggs. Um, and of course, our pathologist said, we have to study the eggs, or we have to study these fish for at least two years. And each river that we wanna take fish from, we have to study them for two years, which we said for diversity, we would go four or five rivers to get that. And so then you have to have 150 fish per river to do a two year study. But uh, in New Zealand, that was presented as a uh, project for them and they turned it down. And they turned it down because some of their rivers that we want to take fish from only have 300 fish. And you're going to take half of them and all females, all spawning females for two years. And then we're as a tribe going to go back and ask for eggs. It's like, this is totally inappropriate tribal interactions for one, but also it doesn't even make sense for the, for this kind of testing to be done. And then we found out that we have, what, 29 pathogens here in California. All of New Zealand has nine, but we wanna test their fish for all 29 pathogens, even though they say, we don't have those pathogens. Well, our pathologists say, you don't know you don't have them because you never tested them. So <laughs> we have this, this issue going back and forth of trying to, figure out how do we get these salmon back and how do we gain the confidence of scientists that these fish, wild fish, are not gonna bring pathogens and they're gonna pick up pathogens here. If we get those fish back and they swim out to the ocean and back, they're gonna get the pathogens that we already have here. And of the nine pathogens that they have, only two of them, which are in fish farms in the North Island, are different. The others are all the same that we already have, but pathologists worry that it might be a different strain. It might have one thing different, and then the whole population of our salmon will crash. Well, guess what? Our salmon are crashing already, and if we do nothing, it's going to continue to crash, and we're not going to have any salmon, or we still will have a choice, right? Hopefully, the salmon in New Zealand survived, and the Winnemum and the Naitahu people 
we'll make those changes in the future when the salmon here so are no longer here. That there, those salmon will become on the list of bring back, and you guys are all healthy. You all be helping me bring those salmon back then. But until then, um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> where we are. Um, I do want to show you a short clip of what we're working on and, and uh, a little bit about um, the rivers that we're talking about. And uh, it's it's uh, it's a six minute, is it? Yeah, okay. So let's show that. Can we kill the light? Yeah. Wait, hold on. It's Sorry, I'm not sure why the sound isn't isn't working. I did share it with the sound though. Um, what do you mean? We told them that when you're on assignment, you can carry on the mono. I don't know if that was. Click on your little microphone. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm not. Are you trying to say something? No, this is this is what connects to the speakers. It was coming, yeah, I tested it. Not works, but the YouTube video isn't working. All right, can you take the volume of the music? Yeah, the volume is all the way up. Can you change it to the speaker on the Um. Um, so we can do the sound from the projector as well, but we would just have to really switch the input or the output. 
Well, I mean, the thing is, like, the sound is going from the computer right. to... Right, yeah, that's one of my concerns. That's the trouble. Not very close. Like, the equipment itself that we need some kind of setting in the community or maybe the other thing we could do is just you separately not share it through the presentation and then have people online watch the screen through the presentation and that would probably work. I mean that yeah if I stop sharing yeah if you if you don't share it through there we just we hear it no. Play the audio here if you are on you can synchronize. Are you going through Zoom? Is it possible to go to the Um Yeah, so that that worked. Um how do you put the chrome settings in it? The chrome settings. Yeah, um, it's very very easy. Can we play it from the laptop directly when you use the laptop to um, that still wasn't working. Yeah, Hold on. I'm going to try to not do it through Chrome. Wait, I need my mind. speakers and the right. laptop would work. Okay, while well, you're uh, doing all <laughs> that. Thank you. So it might be a bar. I just want to, uh, Barbara, you have a little go into, like, you know, this is the first yeah. time that whenever run eggs or any salmon eggs have come to our river, which is a big deal to us because all of our sacred places, all our villages are all owned by other people on our river. The women of went to own no, nothing on the on the river. However, we have continued our existence and connection to these sacred places, have gone through trespassing signs, have gone down roads that we're not supposed to be on, and to get through these places. And my grams was the person who led us to these. She was born in 1902. Five, her mother was here during the genocide era. And she says that we're only here because they were bad shots. Right. Not that we weren't shot at, they were bad shots. So I, I look back and I think how much trauma happened during that time of watching a population going from 14,000 plus Winnebums on the McLeod down to 395 by 1910. Grams would say she would go with her mother and they would try to go up the trails and they'd come to the village and it, on their way back, half of them would be dead on their return route. And so uh, lots of things that happened during that time and the Winnemum were unable to protect them. They were unable to protect themselves from um, getting wiped out. So bringing these eggs back would have been uh, a dream come true for my grams to see that, you know, we're gonna have salmon on our river again. And that in itself is like a boost uh, in, our, in our way of life because whatever happens to the salmon happens to us. And so if the salmon get to come back to the river, maybe we do too, because the river needs us. We're up there uh, looking at uh, how we can help the salmon. Hey, and uh, the shores of the river pretty much has never been groomed in the hundred years that other people own this land. And there's invasive species that have grown right up and into the waters that are not conducive to anything and should not be there. So are we ready? Yes, okay. we should be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So we welcome you here and we give you our greetings from we, the tongue of the Fenua of the Waitaha people, Ngāti Moamoe people, and Ngātaha people. There it goes. Oh, there. And then uh, I put my hand to the mountain, you know, prayed for the salmon. We're here for these salmon. Let them make their way back home.
into this and I want you to pray. So it's going to be full of salmon someday. All the way up, they're going to be full of salmon, the Landata Noor, the old time salmon. Our salmon that are in New Zealand are so very important to the life of the tribe. It has to happen. The fish have to come back. These fish have to swim home. And until we get our eggs back from New Zealand and the fish are swimming up here, it's the only way they can be recovered. You know, and we're starting off this way. They're getting stronger and they have a chance to swim. That's what I'm talking about. In 2022, with California facing prolonged drought, hatchery-raised winter-run salmon were facing imminent extinction. Federal and state agencies decided to act. Is there gravel swing below it? There's gravel down there. They'll, yeah. they'll stick eggs right here. Yep. They'll hatch. They launched a long-discussed project that would take fertilized or eyed eggs from hatchery-raised winter-run salmon and introduce them into the cold waters of the McLeod, the river that the Winnemumwintu people call Winnemumwiwakit. To implement their plan, the agencies were legally obligated to include the Winnemumwintu tribe in the project planned for their river. So, in an historic initiative, federal and state agencies in the tribe became co-equal partners in the salmon restoration project. The salmon have not been above the dam since the dam was installed. So today, salmon eggs are gonna be brought for the first time in almost 80 years. And it's important that we receive them in a good way. And um, the baby wanted to be here for that. My little eyed egg. It's a beginning for many of you to make some, some good changes in the way that you look at, at your science and maybe the science that you didn't study yet. We're asking that the river receive these eggs. Poop is a hide egg. And so we're asking that that in an old time way, that it, it continues to grow in that way. And then we've put down that song so they have a fighting chance. In a departure from standard fish culture practices, the first batch of hatchery eggs were placed in barrels beside the river, with river water running through them. But a few days after the eggs were introduced, the river became murky with sediment released by upstream McLeod Dam, owned by PG&E. Fearing the eggs would be smothered, fish scientists scrambled to move the eggs into heath trays, the standard hatchery equipment for egg incubation. So the hatchery trays, they're the ones that they say they're the most successful because they have the most live fish from that tray. It seemed okay with 5,000 eggs, but then when the eggs started developing into alvins and fish, it seemed like it was like looking at a can of worms. You know, even though we're not fish biologists, we are from fish families, fish people. And uh, our parents were the ones who were born on the river, that lived on the river until Shasta Dam was filled. They came from this river fishing. And so uh, the knowledge passed on from them is what we're going on. The developed fry were then released into the Winnemumwiwakit, and 1,600 were caught in traps before reaching Shasta Lake Reservoir. They were then let go into the Sacramento River below Shasta Dam to continue their journey to the sea and hopefully return in three years as adults. May 1st. May 1st. On May 1st, 2023, the tribe and the agencies made their agreement official. The project will use hatchery-produced winter-run eggs 
until McLeod River salmon eggs can be brought home from New Zealand. The Chinook that we're looking to bring back, you know, they're originally from this river. They're still wild. You know, we saw them in the wild, way up in the high country, you know, where the waters are like this. It's cold and, and they have a glacier melt. In addition, planning will begin for a volitional fish passage to allow the salmon to swim naturally around Shasta Dam. The future of salmon is us helping them come home. The reality is, in the state of California, for the most part, they haven't been able to get home. Bringing salmon home is part of salmon's future in California. So Chief, thank you for your leadership in that regard. For the egg introduction of 2023, Chief Sisk and her team developed an innovative design for an incubation tank that includes important elements of a salmon spawning bed. It'll have spawning rocks in this egg tank so that the eggs get associated with the rocks. And we developed it based on, you know, a more natural system. I like how they have the chance to swim any way they want to. Yeah. I see my little babies. Oh yeah, they're swimming. This is like what they would be in the river. They're swimming free, very gentle current in here, like as if they were in the nest. We believe that there's a connection between these eggs and the spawning rocks themselves. And the magnetism or the things that exchange between the rocks and the fish are part of what brings them that desire to get right back to this place. As Alva, they still have the egg sac, and they're not such good swimmers. But once it's zipped up, they'll swim through this channel and into this pool, where there's different flows, so they're learning how to maneuver in the current. And they have the vegetation around them, so they're more apt to know how to maneuver the banks in the river system. Until they decide to go out this channel, and this channel goes into the side channel on the river, which is something that Winnemum's always built. And you would find the little fish in the side channels because they're, they're protected there. It's just really cool to see their behaviors. And oh, yeah. They need to kind of use the whole water column when they're ready to. And that's what they need. I mean, they have to learn how to do that. And when they're in the trays, they don't have that vertical space, just right. like you said. Yeah, it's true. They're practicing their swimming in the vertical. It's like giving back the respect to those fish to do what they're supposed to do, develop their connection to these rocks and all of the plant life here. That's the reason they come back. It's like, how can they even come back if they're in plastic trays? Where are they coming back to? It's like, it doesn't even make sense to me, but that's the science. You know, we lost some eggs. We don't know exactly what happened, but it happened. And it affects all this place, all everything around. I know in my heart when I heard that many eggs had died, I felt a lot of grief. So I just really asked for Creator's help. And we've also uh, found some parasites in some of the eggs. And so we need to discover what, what's going on with that and how that is coming in here. This is an empty egg with the uh, worms in it. Oh. Rachel. Rachel. So how do they get inside the egg? Like they were alive in that one egg I videoed uh, swimming. So it was a pink egg with the parasites swimming in there. Did you actually see an embryo in there too? We're still praying for our salmon in New Zealand. We have to make a path for them to return. Just to call on everything that we can to help open the doors, change people's minds, do the right thing here, and bring those fish from this river back to this river. And, and things are gonna change. It's a beginning. 
but we're not going to stop until there's a volitional passage and until we get our eggs back from New Zealand and the fish are swimming up here. It's the only way they can be recovered. We have to come up with different solutions now. Yeah. And that's part of this partnership that, like you said earlier, is never, this has never happened. Yeah, it's never happened before. And so it's, so it is uh, taking a different yeah. view rather than... New ground for us. Yeah. And, and on the side of fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to adjust things on their side, not convenient for us, you know. So it's, it's going to be a struggle, but I well, think you guys can do it. Brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> Struggles. Um, How long ago the, was that? What's that? How long ago was that? Last year. This last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last last year was when we uh, were allowed to do our tank instead of the heat tray. Um, but so many things that uh, science doesn't look at that are really pertinent to fish. Um, and I think because you're not from the river. You're not from these fish. You don't have these beliefs that when you turn the rocks over, it changes the temperatures and the water. You don't have that sound of the rocks tumbling down the spawning grounds coming in. Who tests that? Who tests their medicine? We believe those fish have medicine in those rivers. That's why they don't have pathogens. But as you could see, we were told, don't worry, no pathogens in your river because we have a health surveillance of fish coming into the Livingston Zone hatchery and we know that they don't have pathogens. Plus, we'll put them in an iodine solution before they leave the hatchery and that will kill all pathogens on the outside of the eggs until we did have a pathogen. And all of the whoop de doo about pathogens in New Zealand um, didn't spark the same interest in the pathogen we found on the river. No one, no one got excited about it. No one said, hey, you know, we're going to have to really, you know, look at this, what happened here, where'd that come from? We still don't know what it was. They still have not told us what that was swimming in those eggs and we're gonna do more eggs, right? So we're gonna have, I mean, let's get consistency about pathogens because what if that's the 30th pathogen that we just put in the river, right? So um, we have this situation in New Zealand that we need to have eyed eggs and the uh, situation on the river that we had last year, and I want to explain this, we didn't put that out there, but since you're all scientists, you probably might even have heard about it, is that um, they douse the eggs in iodine before they come out of the hatchery to our area. The first a year that we did this, uh, they drove them down the road. And if you've ever been down in Tadina, it's 10 miles of uh, a wild ride in, you know, some, somewhere where we can't hold still. Anyway, I was told that, no worries, we pack those eggs so good. And, you know, we've done this over and over. And yes, we've driven down bad roads before, no worries. And so when we get them, they're in an igloo, right? And in the igloo is a little sack of eggs that has been swishing around like this the whole way down the road. And so we did tell them that we're not going to do that to the eggs anymore. If we're going to do this, we're flying the eggs in. There's a helipad here, um, and they should be, even that is invasive. But bouncing them down that road, and you didn't pack them in moss or anything, 
They would just switch. It's like, that's the scientific way, I guess. An igloo from Home Depot and put them in a net sack and stick them in there. It's like, it's breaking my confidence in science. But um, the second year where we developed this uh, tank system, that's when the pathogens showed up. And it was too bad because the first batch of eggs, we had three batches of eggs. And the first batch of eggs, both well, the ones in the heat trays and in the first nesting box were fine. The second batch of eggs, they told, well, they told us on the first one that um, regulations had changed and that they had to do an iodine solution at the river with the McLeod River water. They did it at the hatchery, leaving the hatchery because that's regulation. So now they get, they're putting them in different water. They have to rinse them again. So the first time they did it, we refused. It's like, we're good with you doing it one time at the hatchery. And so the second batch of eggs that was delivered in the late uh, July, um, they used the wrong iodine and the whole heat tray batch died. So 15,000 eggs died while we rejected the wash and all of ours in our uh, egg tank survived. And so that's what we're talking about when we're, we're saying it happened. We don't really understand what happened there, but we were also just about ready to get into trouble about algae being in our tank and people being worried that our eggs were gonna suffocate and that they might have to step in and teach us something different about how to save our eggs when we were still developing our system, which we added the spray bars to go across the eggs, which resolved the issue of the algae forming. So when they were just about to say to us, um, we do have a public responsibility, a public uh, trust, that all of their eggs died. And so then that also just kind of subsided. <laughs> It's like, you killed all your eggs. How about us? <laughs> it's like, but nobody ever talked about that again. So that's, that's okay. a mistakes happened here. Yes. And they used the wrong stuff. And everybody was uh, upset and, and sorry that it did. You know, that that many eggs, we lost that many eggs during that time. But now we have um, the... Uh, We have an opportunity to buy Bali Baca, which in, <laughs> it kind of irks me too because they took Bali Baca. Bali Baca is like seven miles of river just outside of the footprint of Shasta Lake, which goes up seven miles on the river and 3,000 acres of land that the Hills Brothers out of San Francisco had owned for a hundred years or so. Then they sold it to Westlands Water District who now owns it, but wants to sell it by the end of the year. Um, we have worked to develop <laughs> relationships after going to the you know, court and everything else with them. I think they're our friends. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely ally, maybe. <laughs> but um, there is a chance that we could buy that. Our interest is, is that not only is it you know, 3,000 acres of our homeland of sacred sites of, you know, at least six villages that have been in private ownership, meaning to me that public has not pilfered it, public has not gone into any of those sacred sites or villages and picked up everything they could. And so it's been preserved in that sense. But in the other is that it is the ideal place to put uh, a biosecurity incubation system that we could bring eggs from New Zealand and put them in this off river system and grow them and then test the parents of any vertically transmitted parasites to satisfaction and then grow the fry to a, a length that could be tested for any parasites passing on to them with and then with confidence, put them into the river. That is the kind of system that I thought we were going to do from the very beginning when I saw that 
tea, you can just douse those eggs in <laughs> iodine and it kills all the parasites on the outside of the egg. And that's exactly what we wanna do with the eggs from New Zealand. But instead we got hammered with this two years of testing, 150 fish a year, 29 pathogens. And this last year, um, we looked at the ideas of testing the eggs and UC Davis was one of those labs that, but we decided that it would be too far for fresh samples to be sent in time to test at UC Davis. So we made a deal with MPI in New Zealand to do the testing. As we were going through that process, MPI decided at the point where we were like, you have to test the 29 pathogens. They're saying, we don't have those pathogens and we don't want to bring them into the country because anything can happen. And we'll test for the ones that we have, but we're not going to test bringing in cultures of new pathogens that are not in our area. So they declined um, to do this work. So then we made a deal with Australia, labs in Australia. It's closer than the US. Um, and before we were done explaining everything uh, to the degree that we needed testing done, they said no. <laughs> so now we're, we're coming back to UC Davis. The first choice that we didn't pick because of obvious reasons. Now New Zealand has a decline in fish and the only fish that they're gonna give us is post-spawned salmon. So we don't know when they have spawned, but we know they spawned. So it's not like they just spawned, we caught them. They could have been there for a week guarding that nest. And in my mind, um, that's not the healthiest fish, it's dying. It's a fish that's dying. And so, that almost would go against us in trying to test fish that are already spawned and not knowing how many days ago that spawning took place. And so now uh, we, we're talking with Dr. Soto at UC Davis, and now he said no. So now it's like, oh, there we heard of a lab in Washington State. There's a lab in Washington State. And it's like, when does this stop? When does the struggle just stop and just do the eye to eggs, just test for the vertically transmitted parasites and put them above the dam so that they can uh, thrive? I mean, I've, I've, I know about a lot of the situations in the lower Sacramento and all of the climate change talk about uh, temperatures of the water, flows of the water. It's like, how many more tests do we need to do on the lower sack before people say, you know what? All of this money should be going into a volitional passage. Mm -hmm. Every dam should be, let's figure that out. Nobody wants to figure it out. You know, for years, Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation would say, too expensive when you mention volitional passage. It's too expensive. And it's like, well, how expensive is it? Nobody knows, nobody studied it. So we're studying it now. How expensive is it gonna be? And we did go up and see some of the passage dams in Oregon and Washington that go around the hydro, hydro dams. And we're gonna build one that is a hands off the fish passage. Can you believe it? Nobody can believe it. <laughs> it's hands off the fish, no electrocuting them, no sedating them, no trucking them, and they're gonna swim home. They're gonna swim home and they're gonna swim out to the ocean. It's like, it's almost unbelievable. It's an unbelievable story in scientific terms. But I believe it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. It's gonna happen because the fish need it. They need it. And no matter how many things you do to the lower Sac River, no matter how many uh, spawning rocks you think you're putting in there to make beds and whatever. The river is the one that makes the beds. And all of those rocks that are blocked by the dams are the spawning rocks that should be coming down the river and forming those. And all of the water that's held back by PG&E dam should be coming down the McLeod for the salmon and putting 
the spawning rocks underwater again. That dam is holding water, warming it up, shipping it over to Iron Canyon and warming it up there before they ship it down into Pitt River and it comes back into the lake as warm water. And we did do a study showing that if we took the McLeod River Dam out and all of the cold water went straight into the lake, the temperature of the McLeod would drop all, all, all the way to the footprint of the lake. However, the cold water in the lake probably wouldn't change. So if we took the McLeod River and diverted it into a passage that went down Dry Creek, Cow Creek to the Sacramento River as a volitional passage, it wouldn't make any difference to the cold water pool in the lake, but would add more cold water to the Sacramento River than would come across the lake. So it's like so many winds, <laughs> so many things that could be changed because of that. Um, that that's our goal now. We're we're working towards that. We're working with the Bureau of Reclamation um, on on the Shasta Dam raise issues and trying to convince them that that is not a good idea, that it's never been a good idea. And while we talk about the Shasta Dam and the cold water, nobody is studying the sediments that are at the bottom of the lake. There are mines, there are um, copper smelter mines that have been left open in the bottom of the lake as iron mines and all kinds of things. Uh, and there is a chunk of sediment in the bottom of the lake that warm, it's warm, that's chemicals. It's gonna warm the lake. Not just the sun, but the bottom of this thing. And nobody is talking about how do we clean that out? Even when the lake was down to like 30, 30% full. It's like now is the time to clean that out. You'd hold more water, you'd hold cleaner water, and you wouldn't even have to build it higher. But the Bureau told us that it would be way too expensive because they don't know how to neutralize um, the contaminated materials, the toxic materials in the bottom of the dam. So do we build it higher and just let it build up higher for future generations to deal with? Or, or what's the solution? Because all of that is adding up. You know, it has taken all this time to get that way, but it's not going to go away on its own. It's just going to get worse. And they estimate right now that the uh, contaminants at the bottom of the lake are at least 60 feet deep. So there's the science that I wanna know. Who's studying that part? <laughs> Who's studying the water in the lake? Because you know most of the fish in the lake are contaminated, but we don't hear much about that. There's nothing posted at the marinas or the boat docks or no messages out in any language that says, you know, they're 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 contaminated. But why why not? Because we're a tourist area, you know, every everybody depends on uh, the recreation monies that are coming in. It it's all about funding and who's who's getting those funds. But we're at a time where we need to think about how do we correct some of this stuff? How do we change it for the future generations and not leave them a lake that's half full of sediment of, you know, poison? And for us, it's like, uh, I don't know, as scientists, I had some questions here. <laughs> because all, all of the stuff you hear, you know, I, I'm totally amazed at how much it costs to do the project that we're doing. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's it's like we scavenged those pools from UC Davis, put them together, Dennis helped us put it all together, ran water that's free from the McLeod River into it. We picked up rocks that are from the river, put them in it, we didn't have to buy them. And all of the plants that we put in were all free. And, but, it's an expensive project. Anyway, um, 
and like was pointed out yesterday that there are almost too many uh, science, scientists doing the same kind of project on the same river in the same uh, location and not knowing that you're all doing that. And so that's gotta be expensive. And the results of that haven't really changed anything for salmon. And so um, at the United Nations, um, they're supporting giving indigenous leaders the floor to address needed changes in everything from forestry to fish to uh, endangered species to leaving the people in the, the bush alone. But it's the first time, you know, that uh, we're pushing that the UN recognizes not as NGOs, but as states under our own, our own knowledge about our environment and what needs to be done there. <laughs> The other studies that you guys don't do is like um, the tributaries. Who's, who studies the tributaries of um, salmon use? And then the studies we wanted to know too is like the pathogens. Where do they pick up the pathogens? Is it in the river? Is it freshwater pathogens? And then are there saltwater pathogens? And then do, if that fish comes into freshwater, do the saltwater pathogens die and they pick up river pathogens? And if they come from the river and they go out, do the freshwater pathogens die in the saltwater? <laughs> and the commingling of fish is also a problem in the ocean. It's like if they commingle, uh, do they get pathogens from the river in the ocean to another salmon? And then uh, there's no references here about invasive species in the river or out of the river being studied like on the way to uh, Palusa to Sacramento, there is a prominent vine of some sort that are that's killing the cottonwood trees. And it climbs up the cottonwood and it overhangs it until that cottonwood dies. And then it recedes and it moves on and it hangs over all the willows that are on the river. But there doesn't seem to be any um, anybody studying that or or doing something about that. But we have lots of cottonwood trees that have fallen over into the river going down in that area right now. And we have standing ones that are ready to fall. But the cottonwoods are important to the river system and to the bugs that uh, eat the leaves of the cottonwood and that the fish that eat the bugs that eat the leaves of cottonwood and on and on. Um, in, in the same way is true of the willows. If this thing is killing all the willows, then the bugs that lay uh, that eggs on the willows and, and uh, hatch out are not going to be there for the fish and the food systems of what's healthy for them to eat. But maybe they don't really know they're supposed to eat that because they eat pellets. And so... Um, like with this meeting, I just want to explain too is that um, I got some emails, National Science something, <laughs> and wanted to know if I was going to uh, extend a uh, registration or, you know, to come. And so I, I didn't. It's like, I am so busy. <laughs> I got so many things going on. And a National Science thing is like, uh, maybe not. <laughs> and then uh, Regina, who's with uh, Save California Salmon, called me and said, hey, are you going to this thing? It's like, well, what is it? <laughs> and so that's why I came yesterday is because she said, oh, yeah, they're, they're a, a committee or something that's going to be making some recommendations 
about something about the cold water and about salmon. It's like, wow, there are a ton of committees like that. I mean, I think every agency has one. And I just didn't know uh, the extent or the power of these committees making these recommendations and seeing that um, the tribes uh, really aren't in in the bulk of what I saw yesterday is that you know they don't have any water rights, they don't have any land on the rivers, they're not the scientists you know making the studies, they're not with scientists making claims of studies that need to be done, they're not here. And so there's a there's a situation that I see that if you're making decisions about salmon that are uh, so pertinent to us and that are um, in our stories and our histories and have a place in our culture and we have dances and songs that are dedicated to them that we should be in this a little bit stronger because uh, when you find out what the medicines are for the fish in the river so that they don't have pathogens we're going to be a whole lot better off and we're going to have uh, access to that because um, <laughs> Rachel told me that in order to test a fish for pathogens, that you have to put it in stress. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, you put it in stress, like the water's too warm or the water, something it makes them stress. And it's like, oh, so you mean like if you took a little kid who's healthy and you put him in a hot box, he might develop something. Mm -hmm. Or if you took somebody and you kept water from them, then they might develop some stress, right? It's like, who wouldn't develop something? Mm -hmm. It's like, why don't you take that healthy fish right there and test it to see if it has any pathogens because all of the medicines are in the river now. And if they get sick, just like bears or birds or even your dog eats grass because it knows it's supposed to, not because you taught it to, will seek out its medicines. And when it's in a healthy environment, a cold environment, those pathogens are not going to exist. But when you create the environments where pathogens can exist, which I hear if it is a warming water system, this whole river system is going to be full of pathogens. So we have uh, a little bit of work to do in changing things and changing, because no matter how hard you try, and, and I wish that it were different on the lower sack, it, planting eggs there, you're not gonna get the fish back. Because in, a, in your mind, it's like, we're still, we're accepting fish come back in three years. My grams told me they don't come back for five to seven years. How come they don't come back five to seven years now? They only come back in three years. What happened? Who's studying that? Because they used to be much bigger, much more uh, diverse in size, and they were more prominent in, in the ones who had to climb the mountain, who had to climb 5,000 feet, are different than valley swimmers. We have all valley swimmers. That's why it's important to get the New Zealand salmon back because they are still mountain climbers. Mm -hmm. And they have that, whatever it is, you want to call it a gene, a DNA, or whatever it is you uh, think about. But I know that it has to go up that high. Where are the jumps on the Sacramento River where they're going to be practicing on their way? There aren't any. So when they get to the McLeod, you're just expecting that they're gonna make a six foot jump and go all the way up 5,000 feet. That's not what we're breeding in the hatchery system. And you saw the little uh, albins that were going from rock to rock. It's so cute. It was like, uh, <laughs> the first year they said, oh, don't worry about them because they're not even eating yet. They don't need to swim because they don't have to catch any food. So they just lay on top of each other and wiggle. It's like, but there's so many other things that that fish needs to know 
before it goes out into the river. In the stem of the river, it has to it has to maneuver. You know, one of the things that I think that working with the scientists on this project is is that it's a battle. <laughs> and uh, I think Rachel is one of those uh, scientists that kind of listen and try to figure it out and help us rather than to say, well, this is what we do. This is how it's done. You know, the first the first year we did it, it's like, oh, if you want to bucket those salmon, because I didn't want them to put a tray of four or 5,000 fish into one area of the river, creating a feeding pond. It's like, let's spread them out because this is not normal. And it's like, oh, you can only uh, spread them out during the night because uh, I, got, I don't even know why. <laughs> we we did. And seeing the buckets on the film, it's like we took the buckets and we put them in different places in the water. But then when we caught them down at the bridge in the, in the uh, screw trap, which you know, we used a screw, a screw trap, which isn't really built for catching all the fish, but we put guide nets on it. Well, FICA nets first the year, and then the next year we had guide nets on them. But we caught those fish. And when we caught those fish in traps, we'd go and check in the morning and in the evening. And the first year, it was just the morning. The second year, because we had doubled the eggs, we went morning, noon, and night to check the traps. And whenever those traps are checked, those fish are driven down to the Sacramento River and released. And it was like, you know what? It's not nighttime. How come we're releasing the fish in the Sacramento River when it's not nighttime? Like, was that just like a joke thing? <laughs> it's like, I just wanted to see if you guys would bucket those fish down the river in the nighttime. <laughs> because it really wasn't something else. It's like, just ordering you guys around, that's all. <laughs> but it's it's those kinds of things that uh, add up in science that be, whatever you're putting on those papers, other people are uh, embellishing it. It's like uh, with Livingston Stone saying we don't need no fish passage. It's like, oh, now we've embellished it to say, gee, we just can't really afford a fish passage. And there's really no benefit. What is the benefit of the fish passage? You know, the BOR told me years ago, um, we build those ladders and they don't use them. It's expensive to build a red bluff diversion dam with the fish ladder. They don't use it. It's like, yeah, where'd you put the fish ladder? Well, it goes right up like uh, Sacramento River down here by the park, right up side of the bank. It's like, oh, do the fish run on the side of the banks? No, they don't. They sleep on the side of the bank. They rest at the side of the bank. They run in the middle. That's why the bears go out to the middle to catch fish. They don't stand on the bank to catch a fish. That's why the tribes built weirs out into the river to catch fish. And so it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, we just have some uh, uh, like common sense that it doesn't, is not shared. But I think that um, whatever your mission is in your suggestions here is that I hope that you really push the volitional passage is needed and that getting fish to the natural cold waters where the habitat is pristine and healthy is where the fish are going to strive. They're going to make it. They're going to show um, that condition of the river system is the condition of your pathogens. And I also believe that if those fish swim back from the McLeod River where they receive volcanic ash, who's studying that, on their skins, that they are uh, medicines that put on their skins to go down the Sacramento River. And when they come back, that pristine water and that volcanic ash also eliminates pathogens, the hitchhikers, so that they're not spreading it into their own systems. So anyway, uh, hope I didn't use all the time. I have my brother down there waiting, the fish man. <laughs> so thank you very much.
And are you uh, willing to entertain some questions from the community? Oh, I think there's questions. <laughs> the, the whisper, I think, is. is <laughs> but thank you for yeah. such a, a, a wonderful and all encompassing talk. So, for the committee members, any questions of Chief Six? Uh, Jay, uh, thank you very much for a really wonderful presentation and a lot of wonderful history and, and insights into Hugo Fish. Um, the, the screw traps we capture probably not all of the fish. Yeah, what happens to the rest of them? Are you seeing any others that have escaped and are coming back? Yes. Oh, no, they are eaten by the bass. We have an invasive species. We had a five inch bass that ate 12 salmon. So, once they get in the lake, they're eaten pretty much. Uh, the other one of the problems with the screw trap is that. Because it was a hurry up system, an emergency response to the temperatures in the lower part, uh, they weren't really prepared to catch the fish. And the screw trap was available, and the FICA nets, you know, was an attempt to do that. The second year, uh, a screw trap was installed, but um, guide nets were used, and more fish were caught the second time of doing that. But we don't really have a perfect time because the other thing of it is is that once the fry are in the river and the fry took uh we had fry in the egg box up until late november december in the egg part of the system not even in the pool to swim yet and so those late um, exits are going to stay in the river and they will use the side channels, they will use the tributaries to avoid the high water that should be coming down the McLeod. Of course, high water doesn't really come down the McLeod now because of the dam. But the, uh, the fish that are coming down right now, the issue is how do we catch them? If the flows are too high for the for the guide nets and the screw trap. We have a screw trap in now. It's a very poor way to try to catch a yearling that's coming out. But the yearlings are the ones that you want to get to the river and they are gonna be faster, stronger, and bigger than the bass can catch. And they're the ones, um, the invasive species are not gonna get like they get the little fry easily. But that's that's a scientific thing because by now that's what we're up against. We have the screw trap in up at um, Westland's property trying to catch the yearlings. We know that there are yearlings. A couple of fishing guides last year caught the yearlings uh, near Balibaca and also up at Adina, uh, salmon that were five and six inches. So we know that they are staying. And now this is the task. How do we do this? Thank you again for that presentation. I thought it was just fascinating story and a fascinating uh, way to uh, uh, raise the eggs and fry and so forth and using the natural uh, uh, life history of the salmon. Uh, I, I know there's a landlocked uh, population of Chinook salmon in Shasta Lake. And um, do they use the McLeod to spawn at all? Or where, where do they spawn? Are they yeah. I don't think they, I, I mean, they they put coho in, but I don't think should that get land. Well, I, I, of course, in the great, I'm from the Great Lakes, so I know that they purposely store, uh, um, stock them there. And if you look at the uh, Shasta Lake, what fish are in Shasta Lake, they talk about Chinook salmon as being in Shasta Lake. As a landlocked population, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering they they must spawn in some of the tributaries, I would think. But you know, because that's what they do in like Lake Ontario, right? Yeah, and, and there's natural production going on there. But that salt water, they have to go to salt water. That's fresh water. Fresh water. Yeah. They don't hear. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't heard of anybody catching a Chinook out of Shasta Lake. Seven years ago, I saw a pair in Squaw Valley Creek, 
I'm not sure they were Chinook, um, but I saw a pair of salmon. It's a super rare thing to see. Yeah, yeah they do release the coho there. David, I think you had a question. I'm just curious, um, also echoing the thanks for the presentation, but I'm curious um, how would the volitional passage work getting across the lake? Um, and I know it's in the design phase, so maybe you don't know yet, but how, how would that work? Well, that's the that's where when scientists and engineers and people who have built things like that uh, could build something that would allow uh, one the lake when it lowers because it can go out like two miles uh, when it in a drop year, mm -hmm. which means the salmon will have to have some waterway system. Whether or not that's a, a floating system, or you know, it, it needs to be designed so that it could do that. But also, I'm thinking that there should be some sort of a raceway at the top of the ridge, like when uh, uh, Sacramento River comes in, Cow Creek goes up, and then uh, Dry Creek goes up to the ridge, and then the Shasta Lake is right there. Right. So somewhere there, there would need to be like a raceway where juveniles could uh, adjust to coming down, and the adults could then go across in in some sort of a system over to the McLeod River. But that hasn't, I mean, we have John Ferguson from Washington State and his team to come down and try to help, one, decide uh, what volitional area would be the best. One is to go straight to the dam and up over the top. And the other would be probably go up Stillwater Creek, which a lot of that goes through a lot of um, um, towns and neighborhoods over to I-5 on the other side, which might not be the best. But uh, Cow Creek already has salmon in Cow Creek. It goes up through the pasture land of uh, Cal Cedro, and then Dry Creek goes up uh, past our place. And uh, three years ago, there were salmon at the bridge on Dry Creek. So I know that they, they, use, they utilize that. And they used to come all the way up to where we are um, before so many houses got out there and the water systems sunk and Dry Creek actually dries up. But with more water coming from the McLeod, that whole system would be um, a cold water system to the Sacramento River. But those are things we need to figure out. That's where we need scientists and people who can design something where they don't touch the fish, don't sedate the fish. Thank you. Well, the question I, I'd be curious to ask that in the stream hatchery facility that you have seen, really very innovative. And I wondered, if, is that just a first setup and you've got scientists and as well as bringing traditional knowledge, the merger of those oh, four, is the, that still? Uh, uh, the incubation system that we right. have, uh, it works. I mean, that that doesn't really need any changing much at all. But what I'm talking about is the biosecurity system that wouldn't allow the water from the river to go back into the river because Livingston Stone is below the dam which they're afraid of the pathogens that might be there. But you know what? They weren't afraid of that other pathogen. What happened? Mm -hmm. I figured they'd be jumping up and down and saying, hey, you guys got a pathogen up there? Nobody said anything? Nobody even said, let me see that. Yeah. But that system um, is a mystery to me too, because even though we're, we're targeting building something like that, we haven't been given any parameters of like, the actual cost of something like that, or who certifies it's a biosecurity system, or how does it how does it work? Is it um, how does it get the certification that we could bring eggs from New Zealand and put it in that biosecurity system? The same as that if they took it and put it into UC Davis, but that's the other choice is UC Davis. But then the problem is how do you keep the fish wild? If you put them in UC Davis and regulated temperatures and regulated tanks, how do you keep them wild? You don't. You can't keep them wild. They have to be in the water systems 
and they have to imprint to the water and its food sources that you're that you're introducing that you're going to be really going to make. Thank you. Are there any final questions? Um, no, yeah. Well, lovely talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that New Zealand salmon population are declining. So uh, are you aware of any intervention efforts that they are doing there? Maybe there are some shared experiences uh, because you're basically dealing with similar stress and climate change. Yeah. The interesting thing is, is that um, salmon in New Zealand are invasive species. They're not from New Zealand. And so a lot of their efforts are to save their native fish and eels programs, not so much salmon. And the um, Naitahu people, because we say um, our story, we sent them to the ice waterfall. And in New Zealand, on a rocky, they have ice waterfalls. And that's why they survived in, in New Zealand. You know, the salmon were sent around the world and they were, never survived anywhere else except for there. So they say, now that you know they're waiting here for you, they're not going to stay here much longer. They need to go home. And there'll be a time that there won't be any salmon in New Zealand. So that's the, that's the rush right now. It's like uh, sea level rise is happening. If they get to the place of uh, 1,200 fish, they're at 3,200 for the, all the rivers right now. They say if they get to 1,200, then uh, there will be an effort to, but they won't be giving us any eggs. Like two years ago, uh, the fish and game wanted to know if we wanted eggs. And of course, we're scrambling around trying to do the pathogen studies. Like, oh, just give us those eggs. <laughs> No more questions from the committee, uh, Chief Sis. We'd just like to thank you for all the time. We know that you re redid your schedule to, to be here today, and it's been uh, very enlightening. And, uh, just one of the presented. So, actually, the good Chief Sis now about the day. <laughs> Minimum time, right? <laughs> we always we always say that we're not late as long as the fish are still running. <laughs> and the acorns are falling, we're not late. We don't have to be there when the first one falls. <laughs> you guys are scientists. <laughs> Thank you. We're now going to hear from the US Sprite. Um Kyle DeGiulio is going to speak. He is a senior fisheries biologist. Uh, he's worked with the tribe since 2008. Prior to that, he worked with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He leads the tribe's Trinity River Restoration Program, managing their science and monitoring efforts. And he's also a graduate of Humboldt State. So Kyle, thanks for being here this morning. Yeah, I know what I'm Honored to be here. Just a little bit. There you go. Yeah. Hello. Honored to be here to talk to you on behalf of the Euro today. That was uh, inspiring and frustrating to hear uh, Chief Sis talk about like the struggles of the Winnemucca people to reunite their fish with the critical habitat that they acquire. Um, I'm. I think that the uh, innovation, intuition, and deep knowledge of the Winnemucca are critical to a successful recovery of winter run if it happens. So hopefully, uh, we can we're all work together towards that. I have a statement that I'll read for you. Um, the Yurok tribe has lived with and along the lower Klamath River far longer than uh, than is recorded and has the largest tribal membership of any Native American tribe in California today. 
It also conducts the only Native American commercial fishery in the state, as well as a cultural subsistence fishery on several species that depend on the Trinity and Klamath Rivers. The Trinity River is the largest tributary to the Klamath River and produces half or more of all the salmon that pass through the lower Klamath River. These fisheries are held in trust by the federal government. Despite this, Southern Oregon, Northern California coastal coho salmon were listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1997 and have not been recovered. Klamath River Fall Chinook salmon were declared overfished following the 2017 season and continues to meet the criteria for overfish status in 2023. In 2018, NOAA Fisheries determined a petition to list Upper Klamath Trinity River Spring Chinook salmon had merit and has not completed a status review, but the stock was listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act in 2021. In 2022, NOAA Fisheries additionally found that a petition to list song Chinook salmon had merit and is under status review. The courts have determined that the recovery of these stocks is long overdue. Over the last seven years, all Yurok tribe salmon fisheries have been severely curtailed or closed, damaging tribal communities, communities physically, culturally, and economically. California sport and commercial Chinook salmon fisheries have been closed throughout the entire state for two years, and there has been no season for coho salmon in the state since prior to listing in 1997. The management of the Central Valley Project and the impact to the Sacramento San Joaquin and Trinity Klamath Rivers has played a key role in the decline of these uh, culturally, economically, and ecologically important species. The Yurok tribe is a strong advocate for recovery of salmon over their range and supports more responsible management of the Shasta Reservoir cold water pool to support populations that no longer have access to critical habitat upstream of Shasta Dam and the tribal cultures who value them. However, water exported from the Trinity River to the Sacramento River should not be relied upon to support habitat requirements of species in the Sacramento River at the risk of recovery of climate based species. During 2021, Trinity River diversions were used to preserve Shasta Reservoir Cold Water Pool in an effort to avoid three consecutive years of very low survival for winter runcheon of salmon in the Sacramento River. These diversions did not prevent low survival of winter run in that year. Trinity Reservoir storage and cold water pool was depleted, and sunk coho salmon egg survival was very low in the Trinity River and at Trinity River Hatchery as a result of warm water release from Trinity Dam. These types of impacts were narrowly avoided through extreme management measures in 2022, and low Trinity Reservoir storage condition persisted. The Trinity River Act of 1955 authorized the construction and operation of the Trinity River Division of the Central Valley Project and made two provisions for those operations. The first required that fish and wildlife of the Trinity River were preserved and propagated, and the second required no less than 50,000 acre feet of water made available annually for downstream users. The remaining surplus water volume captured was to be uh, available for diversion into the Central Valley Project. Decisions to divert Trinity River water must meet these provisions before water is surplus to the requirements to protect the Trinity River and downstream communities. <clears throat> decisions in 2021 and other years have not put the needs and risks for the Trinity River first when deciding whether there was water available to export or from the Trinity River. The existing minimum storage requirements for Trinity Reservoir in the NOAA Fisheries 2000 Biological Opinion are not protective of critical habitat requirements of species downstream from Trinity Dam. Reclamation and others have conducted studies that have shown higher storage requirements are necessary to reliably meet habitat needs. Additionally, due to uh, inadequacies of infrastructure, there are times of year when diversions contribute to cooling releases to the Trinity River to the point that they inhibit the growth of juvenile salmonids. And there are other times of year when diversions are necessary to make water releases to Trinity River cold enough to provide critical spawning habitat and incubation habitat for some water reproduction. Because diversions affect critical habitat of fish and wildlife downstream in the Trinity River, they must be managed to limit these impacts. In the future, both timing and volume of annual diversions must consider the direct impact to temperature of release to Trinity River and possible future impacts to temperature. Trinity River storage impact the temperature of release. 
only after which water may be determined to be surplus to provisions for the Trinity River and diverted to the Central Valley for use to the be to best meet the needs of the species in the Sacramento River, as well as other uses authorized by the Central Valley. Take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Kyle. Questions. Yeah. Can we get a written copy of your statement, Kyle? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Provide. Any further committee members? Yeah. Thank you, Chief Sess. Would you like to add to that? I just wanted to know if uh, you are aware of any studies of the salmon return up to Sacramento that would have been uh, for Trinity water. The salmon return up to Sacramento. When we release the water down the Sacramento River from the Trinity, are any of those salmon coming back up the Sacramento? Trinity fish coming yeah, around. Trinity yeah. fish. I'm not aware of any um, documented instances of Trinity River fish straying into the Sacramento. The you would only know if it was a hatchery fish or if you did genetics to figure that out. So uh, it's unlikely that you would you would. Be able to find that unless you have a really broad, uh, a really broad. Study, I don't. Are believe, they looking for that? I don't believe so. They you wouldn't find one. Not correct. One. correct, correct. And um, if fish follow the water, and we're dumping Trinity water down the Sacramento, it, it it very well could. It likely does occur, and it likely happens to some extent naturally because they are. Somewhat close together in the in the entire range of salmon, but it could be exacerbated by Trinity water. We haven't looked at that or studied it. We do know that Clear Creek, which Trinity water flows down through Whiskey Count Dam, now contributes far more salmon proportionally to the Sacramento run than it ever would have naturally. So there's new runs of salmon established in Clear Creek as a result of the diversion of Trinity water into that system. I think that's Jay, did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that they are now collecting the eyeballs and ear bones of a lot of the fish carcasses, and they should be able to see from those isotopic studies where they came from. Just a little bit on that. While we were in New Zealand, they did collect those samples, but they did express that it was so expensive to study them that they just collect them to run their typical testing. They don't test them with the lasers to see where they came from yeah. or what rivers they were in. Yeah. in, in, in yeah. Yeah. But, but here it's fairly routine now, as I understand. Yeah. Just anecdotally related to the Trinity fish this year, you know, there was a really, we didn't move water in the same extent last year. And we had some of the lowest returns on the Sacramento for fall run ever. And uh, the Trinity returns were actually much larger than they have been for spring. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 not and not terrible for fall run. So it's a it's an interesting it's interesting to me that the they're the yeah. Thanks for that. I think that perspective. Are there other questions for Kyle? I think your statement was very comprehensive. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I wish you luck in the work that you're thank setting out to do. Yeah, well, thank you, Kyle. Thank you. So, before we conclude this, this morning's uh, session, uh, we wanted to open the floor and see if there was any comment from. Uh, members of the public, but before we do that, uh, Dr. Myro is having to join the committee remotely, and I just wondered if she had any questions of the speakers this morning. Uh, th thanks for asking. I, I actually don't, but but really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us when uh, you have a lot of other things going on. So I'd just like to, to, to ask the general audience, is there anyone like to make any final comments or questions, things you'd like the committee to hear? Hearing none, 
I'm not sure if Dr. Mooney or Dr. Israel have any final comments for the committee today? In the reclamation, please. Just like to continue to thank the committee for their efforts today and thank you to Chief Sis and Powell for coming to speak with us. Okay, well, thank you. And I'd like to just echo that on behalf of the committee. Yeah, Chief Sis, if you'd like to come up again, <laughs> maybe on the mic if you had oh, questions or not. I was just thinking that maybe this is the committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, expecting great things from you guys. But I was just thinking about the sites reservoir, and it puzzles me as to whether or not that's going to harm salmon more by taking water from the Sacramento, warming it up in a uh, waterless tubby, <laughs> and then putting it back into the Sacramento River at various times. And even the efforts to do um, the ground, I mean, the uh, floodplain efforts would be affected by the uh, water coming out of the site's reservoir. And I know that project is going ahead and it seems like it, it is a big threat um, production to salmon coming and going. So with that uh, being the final comment, uh, Laura, is there any final remarks from the National Academies? We're going to adjourn the open session now. Okay, so let's uh, just give both of our speakers this morning another round of applause for such a comment. <laughs> Thank you all. We've now closed the meeting. Thank you very much for participating. And we're going to take a 15 minute break for the committee.